The space sector, much like our experience here on Earth, is no stranger to adversity. From the technical challenges of space exploration, to the unpredictability of cosmic environments, to the financial challenges which all companies are facing at some point or another. Yet, navigating through this issue requires not only advanced technology, but unparalleled human resilience. It's often thought that these challenges are what make the most groundbreaking discoveries and push the boundaries of our understanding and capability. Today, with some esteemed panelists, we're going to dive into what the strategies are to overcome some of these challenges and talk about the difficulties that illuminate the innovations and breakthroughs that define our journey through the stars. Today, we're going to begin with Dylan Taylor. Dylan is a global business leader, a commercial astronaut, a thought leader, and a philanthropist. Currently, Dylan serves as the chairman and CEO of Voyager Space, a multinational space exploration firm focused on building the next generation of space infrastructure for NASA and other global space agencies. Dylan is a leading advocate of space manufacturing and utilization of in-space resources for the future space exploration settlement. In 2017, he became one of the first private citizens to manufacture an item in space. I'd also like to, to note that it, Dylan is quite the explorer. Uh, on December 11th, 2021, Dylan became just the 606th human to go to space as a part of the crew of Blue Origin's New Shepard Mission 19. Accordingly, Dylan earned his commercial astronaut wings with the FFA, FAA, FAA and the Universal Astronaut Wings from the Associate, Association of Space Exploration. So Dylan's gonna give a presentation. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, so make sure that you scan and, and put in your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dylan Taylor. Uh, first up, this is a, I'll call this humble beginnings. This was actually my childhood uh, home until I was about eight years old. Uh, my parents got married super young uh, as teenagers. And my dad was actually in Vietnam for a period of time. Thus, uh, we were living in this house uh, until my dad graduated from high school, or I'm sorry, graduate school. So moving on, uh, in my life, uh, I came to the conclusion that you can be successful, uh, but not purposeful. And what do I mean by that? Um, I had quite a bit of success in the business world, uh, but sort of in my late 30s, uh, reflected on the fact that I didn't feel like I was actually living with purpose. A book that really changed my life was called, or is called, The Last Lecture. It's not only a book, it's a, a lecture you can watch on YouTube. Uh, I won't give it away, but at Carnegie Mellon, they have a tradition that as a professor leaves the university, they give their last lecture. And Randy Pausch uh, gave a very poignant lecture about what's truly important in life and following your dreams. Another thing I learned uh, from a mentor of mine is that um, if you can't answer what your values are and what you think is important, then you haven't done enough self-reflection. And so I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about what was important to me, what I admired, the qualities and in individuals I admired, and then I sought out who in my life I wanted to emulate in those particular categories. So for example, work ethic, you can see my father there. Uh, loving, kindness, giving, that's my wife Gabrielle and my Aunt Laura. It doesn't matter who these people are necessarily, but I would just encourage people to identify what's important to them from a values and characteristics standpoint and then find people that, it could be even people you don't know, just people in, in uh, society that you admire and uh, emulate them. So fast forward, uh, I was living life more purposeful in the space industry, which I love. I had a childhood dream of going to space, uh, and uh, it, it came true. December 2021, I had the privilege of being upside down, looking out the window at Earth. Total mind blower, something you can't unsee, something you can't unfeel. It truly changes you, uh, and it's just uh, an enormous gift that uh, it, I'm just enormously privileged to be able to have experienced. 
this is me getting winged by, by Jeff. There was uh, controversy around these US FAA wings. Uh, our mission was actually the final mission that were awarded these wings before the FAA got out of the business of doing so. Uh, and this is the ceremony for the FAA getting wings. The reason this is important, if you look at the right side of the screen, center, red jacket, that's Wally Funk, uh, who should have been a NASA astronaut but was den denied access to space uh, really due to sexism. So the fact that she was also winged at that same ceremony was really, uh, to me, terribly important. And I, I really appreciated the fact I was part of that ceremony with her. Uh, here's Richard getting his wings. He did his in a separate ceremony. Uh, again, he, he gave a very impassioned speech at his private wing ceremony talking about how this was his childhood dream. And so it's great to see people actually experience this and uh, pay this gift forward. So one of the things I've reflected a lot upon, you know, when you're enormously privileged and have these advantages to do these different things, uh, I think the natural emotion is gratitude. And I think the next emotion is how do you pay it forward? And the only thing better than making your dream come true is making someone else's dream come true. And so I found a nonprofit called Space for Humanity, really trying to address access to space. Uh, we've sent four citizen astronauts to space. The first one is Katya. And I'll just talk a little bit about her resilience. So she crossed the border when she was age eight, uh, undocumented with her mother, didn't speak any English whatsoever. And they were living in poverty in Los Angeles. Uh, around age 14, she got a job at McDonald's. She has a dream of working for NASA. That's her dream. Fast forward, she works herself into community college, learns English, does extremely well, gets herself into UCLA engineering school. And for those engineers in the room, you, you understand how difficult that is. And then ultimately gets a internship with JPL. And it, uh, it's tremendously gratifying to see how hard she's worked and how it's paid off for her. Fast forward, she was selected out of, I, I believe, 40,000 applicants to be the first Space for huma uh, Humanity citizen astronaut. And um, she's now a celebrity. She now um, meets with a Mexican president on a regular basis on STEM education. Uh, she was on the cover of Vogue. She's, she's, um, they've made a Barbie doll uh, around Katya. Uh, but more importantly, she's living her best life and she's really promoting uh, STEM education for women in Latin America. So the dream that I have is that everyone in this room can envision themselves going to space and everyone in society can envision themselves going to space. So I'm working tirelessly to try to build infrastructure in space to get people out there. So truly uh, a life with purpose. And uh, as part of that project, the company I run, Voyager, we're uh, focused on building a space station called Starlab. Uh, so that's my next mission is to get this thing in orbit and built. And hopefully all of us can, can go there someday. So thanks for listening and uh, look forward to your questions. So I have a couple of questions for you and audience, please make sure that you take a look at the uh, Slido link there before if you wanna ask your own questions. But curious, Dylan, starting from an engineer turned into a businessman, how did you ever imagine uh, the future of your career in space, not only with all of the ventures that you've put together so far, but also uh, developing a commercial space station? Can you talk a little bit about that thought process and that, that vision that you had? Sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate the, the question, Kyle. I mean, honestly, everything that has happened has exceeded even my wildest dreams. And so the one thing I would also encourage other people to reflect on is, are you aiming high enough? And uh, the fact of the matter is, no goal is too audacious, no goal, no goal is impossible. And even if you don't hit the target and you fall a little bit short, the higher you aim, the higher you go. So to be honest, Kyle, I never uh, imagined that I would be in a position to go to space, to build infrastructure in space. Uh, it was a dream, uh, and I'm just very grateful that I'm in a position to, uh, to do that. Thanks so much, Dylan. As a, as a businessman, you understand the, the fluctuations in the market and everything that's been going on, but the space industry has continued to thrive 
even in the midst of the global economic downturn and the pandemic, what do you attribute to this and how do you foresee operations like Star Lab faring as obstacles continue in the years to come? Yeah, I think um, capital markets are very fickle, as we know. Um, they're on again, off again. But the trend line is generally uh, up and to the, to the right. So if you can create a model that is resilient, which is the key theme of this uh, session, and isn't uh, susceptible to minor uh, perturbations in the capital markets, and you can ride out the rough waves and then ride the favorable waves, uh, then I think you can be successful. I think what most people don't do is they don't stress test their model and they don't have a plan B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, they haven't even thought through what if. And I think, um, you know, someone said, well, entrepreneurs are risk takers. I disagree with that. Entrepreneurs are risk mitigators, and they're very good at uh, managing risk. Um, so I think that uh, ethos will carry you through any financial market that you might hit. One last question for me, Dylan. Uh, you talked about this having a numerous plans, and, and I think that's really important. And I think the thing that the space community is always trying to do is show how we can use space for the benefit of Earth. Can you talk a little bit more about the numerous businesses you have in Star Lab and how you think that the technology that's being developed is going to benefit life here on Earth? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I encounter a lot of people, like many of you do, who say, look, space is folly. We have many more problems here on Earth. And uh, why are we focusing on that? I'm in the camp that says space is a tool for transformation. So put the science aside, put biopharma aside, put space manufacturing aside. Ask yourself, why do we have all these intractable problems? Why can't we communicate better? And why can't we solve things like climate change? And my view is we don't have the right perspective. And the one universal perspective shifter that I'm aware of and that I've experienced myself is space. So I think the more we expand our awareness into space and the more people get a chance to experience that, the more likely it is that we can tackle these challenges here on Earth. Dylan, thank you so much for joining us today. Everyone, please, thanks, Dylan. So next, I would like to welcome Sita Santi. She's the Chief Exploration Officer of Space Tango, and she manages the implementation of the corporate mission and the vision. Prior to joining Space Tango, Santi led the space industry practice for the Boston Consulting Group, a global management consulting firm, and she made history as the head of human spaceflight sales at SpaceX, where she executed the first private spaceflight sail on the Crew Dragon on a lower Earth orbit free flyer and to the International Space Station while guiding the global market for Starlink's expansion. Prior to SpaceX, CETA was the Vice President for International Business with the Sierra Nevada Corporation, teeing up the spin out of Sierra Space, as well as the Director for National Security and International Business Development at Raytheon. Before joining the space industry, CETA amassed over 17 years of service as a career US diplomat. She led the International Security Advisory Board bringing A&D companies strategic recommendations to Secretary Casey, Kerry, and also served as the Chief of Staff for the Legislation Affairs and Senior Advisory for the Defense Sales to South and Central Asia. Her overseas posts include Croatia, Libya, Syria, and the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq and Egypt. Sita also is, uh, has one of the most difficult jobs. She is a, a single mother of two teenagers. Please put your hands together for Sita. How's everyone this morning? Awesome. I have these notes, but I'm gonna go off script. Is that okay with you? <laughs> okay, namaskaram, namaste, salam, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dobar dan i dobroste došli. Bonjour i bienvenue. Good morning and welcome. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here today to follow up Dylan Taylor, I mean, how do you do that? That's just impossible. To talk about, in principle, not just my story or our stories on overcoming adversity 
and navigating through a challenging lens in the space industry, but really our shared stories. So allow me to introduce myself. Sita Santi. Kyle very kindly described a little bit about my background professionally. Um, one thing I like to do when I introduce myself is say something that you won't find on LinkedIn, right? Something you won't find on Instagram. Yes, I'm on Instagram or Facebook or any of the number of interviews that many of us have had the opportunity and the honor to do in our past. Um, and I really am grateful to Kyle for introducing me first and foremost as a single mother of two teenagers, because I would argue that's probably the most important job that I've ever had, and by far the hardest, no doubt. And yet, while I'm a mother, I've also been bestowed this incredible honor to be the chief executive officer of Space Tango. I began this role exactly one month ago today. I'm really excited to share that opportunity with you all and tell the story not just about myself, but also what overcoming adversity has meant for Space Tango as a company in its journey, and essentially actually bringing it onto the international stage. One thing that's been interesting in my conversations with many of you in the audience who might see some familiar faces, hi Aras, thanks for coming today. Um, one of the things I like to tell about Space Tango is people have not heard a lot about the company. There's pros and cons to that in the space industry. Many space companies, I think we can insert, fill in the blank here all collectively, have significantly captured public imagination, right? They've done so by testing the laws of physics. They've done so by commoditizing the price of, let's say, launch or the development of a satellite. We all know who these players are. But what's even more interesting is all of the capability that's been built on the back of the stories that are well known. So the story of Space Tango is, quietly, this company has become an industry leader in automated systems and the pursuit of health and technology manufacturing in space. Okay, that's a nice description, but what does it really mean? What are we really doing? And where are we going from here? Before we talk about where are we going, we need to talk about where we've come from. So here's a little bit about where the industry has been. A couple of interesting milestones, right? We're all, these are all familiar to us. Valentina Tereshkova in 1963, Apollo and Soyuz docking 1975, the first spacecraft to fly by Halley's Comet nucleus in 1986, courtesy of the European Space Agency. Were those government achievements? Anyone? Yes, maybe. Were the industry achievements? They were human achievements. Pause for a moment. Those were human achievements. What is the purpose of this entire panel? Why are we here at this giant conference? Yes, we want to exercise deal flow. Yes, we want to convince customers that the services, products, and goods that we are offering will enable access to space because, as we've said, it's cheaper, it's easier to do, and the technology advances have been made. But at the end of the day, these are human individual achievements built on the backs of technologists and government leaders in history, and that's what exactly the space industry is particularly known for, right? So when we think about the benefits of space exploration, the space industry, and what we're all here to do together, notice I said together. Can any one company or can any one government achieve all of these things on their own? I would argue no. So when we consider those benefits, we must acknowledge the value of human cooperation. So why talk about human cooperation at all? For me, this time it's personal. So as Kyle very kindly offered, my first career was actually as a diplomat for the United States government. I'm honored to say I represented the American people over 17 years, and interestingly, in a lot of the roles that I held, space was quite often a topic. And part of the roles that I've held, you'll see in, in, my, uh, in my interesting series of destinations, Croatia, Libya, Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, Egypt, a number of other places that I had little way stations along the way. How was there connective tissue between a career in diplomacy where I assure you there was no shortage of adversity in each of those roles? For my family, for myself, for my teams, for the people that I represented, 
for the friends that I made, for the partners that I had internationally. There was no shortage of adversity. Was that part of the space economy? Well, it was on the journey there. So then suddenly I end up in space industry. And yes, Inspiration4 is one of the most proud moments of my career when we signed Jared Isaacman. How many people know who Jared is? Inspiration4, right? Great mission. What an inspiring story to actually create a platform for private astronaut missions. Was there adversity along the way? Absolutely. So what, what are some of the common themes here? When we talk about the history of getting up there, what is it that keeps us going through adversity? Whether you're a diplomat that's trying to convince somebody on the other side of a negotiation to partner with you and to trust you, or you're a space executive and you're trying to convince somebody on the other side of the table to negotiate with you and trust you. That's the connective tissue. And it certainly has been in my personal journey. So the history of Space Tango has been the most exciting step along the way. This is a company that began out of the Kentucky Science and Technology Cooperation Center. It came out of the University of Kentucky. The genius Twyman Clements actually designed this company in order to perform research and development in microgravity for a variety of use cases. But what's exciting about all of that is that it's been done quietly. And the story of Space Tango is very simple. Flight heritage, customer heritage, technology heritage. So in order to continue and build on the adversity that comes in a lot of our personal stories, because I'm sure each and every one of you has experienced adversity along the way as well. The four of us just happened to have been selected to do this TED Talk, but any one of you should be up here telling your story. You still always take a moment to say, what did I learn from that? Why did I go through that? What were my primary takeaways? I would argue the three takeaways from my career, both as a diplomat, serving in, uh, in some hostile environments, shall we say, as well as a space executive, is space can be a real enabler for technology transfer and knowledge transfer between peoples, between industries, between academia, between institutions. Space is a tool of economic statecraft. It is a venue where you could actually conduct a transaction that sets the course of history. But make no mistake, in order for those milestones to have occurred on slide two or whatever in my presentation, there was tremendous economic statecraft required, which means you have to convince the person on the other side of the table to negotiate with you and to trust you. Finally, especially today, but not only today, space continues to be one of the most powerful tools of foreign policy. People are everywhere at the conference today are really talking about the Artemis Accords. But it was interesting. I was doing this interview a couple weeks ago, and I was describing the International Space Station, which happens to have been the host for Space Tango's 261 payloads and counting of research and development content. And yet, the ISS, when I described it, I said, I think it's like Switzerland in space. It's always been, historically at least, a neutral zone, a location for civil and commercial cooperation where you can exercise economic statecraft and foreign policy. In order to find the resilience that we need, we also have to adapt with the technology that becomes available to us. So a main takeaway for us as an entire community here is that as the technology adapts, so must we as leaders, so must we as humans, and trust your talent on your team. So I'll leave you behind with a quote that always stays with me. Uzayam no razumie vanye, biće ne izmjerno lakše korištenjem jednog univecarnog jezika. Nikola Tesla. Presumably you all know who that is. I have to practice that quote, by the way. <laughs> what does it mean? Mutual understanding will be infinitely easier if we speak the same language. So how do we find resilience and overcome challenges? This isn't my story. This is everyone's story. Speak the same language. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I was really impressed with the curation that you just ripped out. That's, uh, that's incredible. Uh, a few questions from myself and audience. Please remember to use the Slido app to ask any of the questions that you may have. First, you've obviously had an incredible career. If there is a young person that's in the audience and they're looking for some advice to how they could enter into the space industry or particularly they're interested in the microgravity environment, what kind of advice would you give them? Join us, right? Uh, that's a great question, actually. Um, thank you. I would say probably three things. One, do not be limited by what you don't know. And I say that because I, in many roles, particularly as I started in this industry, felt, well, I'm not an engineer. I don't have a background in engineering. I'm not a biologist or a chemist, which particularly for microgravity research can be a really advantageous knowledge base. But I do do these other things, so maybe I can apply what I do know and not be afraid of what I don't. I would say the same thing to anybody who may have one particular skill set or knowledge base or even just a passion for the industry, which is do not be afraid of what you don't know. The second thing I would say is think in terms of the creative applications for what problem you want to solve. And I say that because I think our industry is very full of rich talent of people who are problem solvers. Literally, people who have solved the problem of getting to the moon and back and destinations further beyond. And yet, if we are thinking about solving problems in some of the same ways, then we may not get to different destinations. So if someone is young, but they want to lean into their creativity, I think that's going to really set them apart. And then finally, courage. It takes courage to get up here on the stage and talk to you all today. I think it takes courage to approach someone at a conference or in any other kind of academic or professional setting and say, I would like to join your industry. I would like to learn more. I may not know much, or maybe I do, but I think courage is probably the one thing that I would encourage anybody, young or old, to uh, maintain with them. Thanks. Thanks for that. So if you do see Sita somewhere uh, in the conference these next couple of days, please feel free to, to reach out and say hello. Uh, we do have one question for the audience, and then I have one more question. But how, how can we ensure that space remains trustworthy to the public as a neutral and cooperative environment during turbulent times? That's a brilliant question, um, especially since, as you've heard, both in my personal journey as well as um, building off of Yuval Noah Harari's lecture yesterday on the safety and the ethics of technology. How do we ensure that safe is both secure from a technological perspective and also protecting intellectual property and protecting international sovereignty, but also trustworthy technology? I think what actually comes at the foundation is remembering why are we making this thing, whatever it is that we're making. Why are we deploying this thing, whatever it is that we're deploying, and making sure that the answer to that question always comes back to the protection and promotion of human life somewhere. If we can always remember and anchor our industrial choices, our foreign policy choices, our national security choices, our technological development choices to the well-being of a human being, I don't mean humanity, because the more we talk about humanity, it becomes very conceptual and abstract, but if I can tie it back to a member of my family or a member of my team or community, that ethics is actually what's going to motivate us to develop the right kind of technological solutions that become trustworthy. Thanks, and one last question for myself. So the year is 2033, 10 years from now. What are some things that you're gonna be proud about that Space Tango has accomplished? Oh, that was a softball, I like that question. Um, 10 years from now. I will be proud that Space Tango went from 261 payloads of flight heritage in three, four years to 26,000 in the first two years of that decade. Um, we will be able to scale our ability to do layer by layer deposition to create artificial retinas. Those artificial retinas will actually be tested in humans here on Earth. They will amplify vision capability for both those who can and cannot afford that level of advanced technology, and people will see. That, in 10 years, I, I'm really excited to say I believe we will be very proud of that. Um, also, I'm proud to, I, I would love to be able to say 10 years from now, we developed as a company the richest, most diverse, most uh, creative and 
most energetic group of critical thinkers in the space industry. I think far too often a lot of both companies and teams can develop cultures inside them where you don't really look towards a diverse set of opinions, but that is absolutely a priority for us at Space Tango. So I have no doubt that 10 years from now we will be bigger and we'll actually be exponentially more diverse. By the way, we already have a 50% female uh, staff, which I'm very proud of. So we're going to maintain those numbers. I'm sure you're an excellent role model for that. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in thank you, Sita. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Next, we have Valeria. She's a long-term friend and uh, someone I'm really happy that could come and speak to you and share her story. She studied at the University of College London and she did her master's thesis on the strategic positioning of Russian space companies on the international market. She used to work at GK Launch Services, which is a daughter of Roscosmos. Uh, she provided launches for the Soyuz 2 for the international customers. And while she was doing that job, she met her current partners and the co-founders of Aerospace Capital in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Valeria. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I started to work in the space industry right after I completed my studies because from a very young age, I always dreamed to work in this sector. I started my career at GK Launch Services, a commercial operator of the Soyuz 2 rocket launches from Russian cosmodromes. And um, there I met my future partners and together we co-founded an aerospace capital that's a Russian private company that designs separation systems for CubeSats and Microsats. At that time, five years ago, there were not many private space companies in Russia, and our pathway was full of challenges and, of course, opportunities. CubeSat spacecraft market is continuously growing as pushing the CubeSat mission is a relatively affordable way um, of uh, joining the space industry and, of course, to test the new technology. I like the concept of CubeSat spacecraft. They all have standards to follow, and that unites all CubeSat designers globally. It also allows companies like Aerospace Capital to create a serial production of deployment systems to provide our customers CubeSats with affordable and reliable CubeSat adaptation, launch, and in-orbit separation services. Today we're here to speak about uh, our pathway in these turbulent times, but I want to share some short information about us at first. So as of today, we successfully separated 54 CubeSat spacecraft into orbit with the use of our systems. Also, this summer, we launched a free new CubeSat platform with a PicoSat deployer, from which six PicoSats were uh, successfully deployed, totaling the amount of spacecraft uh, to 60. Our key technical solutions were flight proven within multiple Soyuz 2 and Fregate upper stage missions, both from Baikonur and the newest Vostochny Cosmodrome. We started to design our separation systems back in 2019, and for the past five years, we had our ups and downs. The issues that the uh, COVID-19 epidemic brought were really challenging for our small startup back then. Our first launch mission with two deployers on board and nine CubeSat spacecraft, from which six of them were for international customers, was scheduled for March 2020. And as you all remember, that was the first peak time of the pandemics, when uh, air travel was limited even domestically, when quarantine and self-isolation was strict in most of the countries. Our mission was postponed uh, to March 2021, a year later, and our at that time small team of actually less than 10 people were working really hard and partially remotely to make the mission happen. In 2021, all our international customers could reach Moscow 
for satellite integration with our deployers. And that would not be possible without the support of Roscosmos, which facilitated the participation of our team and our customers for launch activities. Um, we successfully completed that mission. And uh, after that, we gradually economically recovered. And since then, we grew a lot. Now you can see some photos from this first launch campaign during COVID. The photos are taken at our clean room at the Aerospace Capital's office nearby Moscow. And the photo on the right was taken at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, where we installed our systems on the frame of a legendary frigate upper stage. Lately, we started to have more domestic customers than international. And on these graphs, you can see a proportion of uh, international CubeSat spacecraft versus Russian CubeSat spacecraft that were launched in our deployers. As you can see, on the first mission, almost 70% of uh, CubeSats were for international customers. Last year, we launched 16 uh, CubeSats for Russian universities. And this year, we had uh, the launch with the highest amount of spacecraft uh, that were launched in one mission, 29. And also, if we count PicoSats, that gives us 35 satellites. And only two of them were for international customers. 11 of the satellites were launched for private commercial Russian space companies, and 16 spacecraft were launched for the Space P project. We are partners of the Space P program, which brings together school children, students, universities, professionals, and private companies across the countries to work and launch a real space experiment. As of today, with the use of our nine deployers, the program has already 35 satellites in orbit, and in upcoming years, they aim to have 100 of them. You can scan the QR code uh, to access the information about the uh, program's uh, missions, which are all also available for joining for the international space community. On the photos, you can see some CubeSats that were made uh, together with uh, students and professionals. And we're honored to be partners of the program. And it's exciting to see how children and professionals work together across our whole big country in the space labs. Regarding the challenging times uh, that we live, we continue to work even harder. And we are now developing uh, our new product, a low shock separation systems for, for satellites of up to 300 kilograms. And our test flight for this new product is set for the next year. You can visit our website uh, to see our news and follow us across the social media. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Спасибо. Valeria, thank you so much for that. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Special thank you, Kyle, for inviting me here today. Of course, of course. So a couple questions. Uh, the first thing I noticed was the growth of satellite launches that you've had over the, the last couple of years. So that was really fantastic to see. But obviously, much more domestic launches over the past uh, year or two. Are you guys still open to working with domestic customers? And how are you overcoming the challenges associated with that? Um, so we're open for both our domestic uh, uh, customers and for international cooperation too. Um, the, we really support the, the development of a Russian CubeSat market. As uh, before uh, Aerospace Capital, there were only several CubeSats that were launched uh, within years and they used uh, foreign deployment systems. And now with Aerospace Capital, we are more accessible for our domestic uh, companies and for universities. So I believe uh, 
We are one of the key drivers that support the growth uh, of the CubeSat market back home. Thanks for that. They have this uh, saying, if you build it, they will come. Do you feel that GK Launch Services has helped to uh, encourage more companies or like you said, the, the school children to build satellites? And um, how, how, do, how do you think that's going to develop over the next couple of years? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, the market uh, and the space became more accessible in Russia because uh, we are close to our customers, we are more affordable, we're reliable, and we also provide some complementary services, such as, for example, producing the test equipment for spacecraft. Also, we offer CubeSat guidance for testing uh, to launch your environments. And uh, taking this all together, I think uh, we made a positive impact on the industry. Thanks, Hillary. I have a lot of questions here, but uh, I want to ask you a personal question. So the question from the audience is, how do you manage to be both sweet and knowledgeable? But my question to you specifically sure, is, that, do. How, did, how, do you, like, how did you get interested in space? And tell us a little bit about your personal journey from where you were to how you ended up into this job. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got interested in space when I was uh, 13 years old. And uh, my dad actually, he was involved in space industry too. And one day he came home to me and I was in the kitchen just eating and he said to me something about uh, rockets, how he likes it and how he loves the space industry. And I thought, wow, that's so cool. And this feeling is still with me and I can't imagine myself being in any other sector. Nothing excites me more than to be here around uh, the international space community. Hillary, one last question. What's the most unusual payload you had to integrate? And are there any limitations to the things that you can integrate on the launcher? Uh, yeah, we had the one, um, not one, but one very special uh, payload. So for the Space P project, the students with professionals, uh, they wanted to launch an experiment uh, with the, our, um, with this Sirene uh, plant. And they made a like, small ecosystem for it in just a free U CubeSat. And it had the water supply, lights, and cameras to see the process uh, of uh, plant growing. <laughs> and actually this plant uh, um, is now in a book of records as the Far, the plans that is the most far away from our Earth. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me thank you, Valeria. Thank you so much. Спасибо. So last today is Manny Shar. He is the managing director for UK and Europe at OrbitFab, supporting the development of a thriving and sustainable in-space economy through the delivery of in-orbit refueling services. Manny has worked across the board on innovation projects from early stage investment to commercial model development in the space industry. Previously, he helped develop Bryce Tech's international consulting presence into a revenue generating and profitable business. He managed the analysis of a multi-billion dollar portfolio of assets at Immersat and executed on cross-functional initiatives at top tier investment banks. He sits on multiple advisory groups and committees, including the UK Space Agency's Space Technology Advisory Board, the UK Space Flight Safety and Regulation Council, the International Astronautical Federation Inter Entrepreneurship and Investment Committee, and a number of others. He holds a master's degree in space studies from the International Space University, where we studied together, I can say, and a bachelor's in computer science at the University of Kent. Uh, I consider Manny to be one of my best friends, so it's very proud to welcome him on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Manny Shar. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone feeling? Awake? Great. Well, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, thank you to uh, the host, Kyle Osiano, and uh, also what a stellar uh, 
a group of individuals telling their personal journey in this industry. I'm really honored to be among that uh, list. Does anyone recognize what kind of picture this is? Yes, correct. <laughs> I mean, I'm at a space conference, so obviously I've got to have a satellite photo. Uh, this is actually my, uh, the, the, the farm that I grew up on in, in uh, rural Sindh in Pakistan. Uh, the farm is called uh, Faridabad, which is named after my granddad, who was the spiritual and kind of the wise leader of, of, of the community. And one of the earliest memories I have from, from, from this place was when I was about five years old. Just imagine impoverished kind of rural community, no, no electricity and no, no running water. But that has pros and cons, right? Particularly the no electricity part, because you can think about no lights. What does that mean? So when you're five years old, you look up at the night sky, what do you see? Just the be most beautiful canvas of stars and the clearest um, view of the arm of the Milky Way galaxy. Just like, I have goosebumps just thinking about that uh, right now. And, um, Ever since then, I was always kind of fascinated about space. And I remember going up to my granddad, you know, the wise spiritual leader of the community. I went and asked him, is it possible to go to space? And he said, no. You know, in this, in this uh, area, there's very limited education. People don't actually know that astronauts are a thing. The people go into space. And then to that, I replied, well, what if we built an extremely large ladder? He still said no, but that to me was a, a, a lifelong challenge to not accept reality and try to accomplish the impossible. And uh, when I was about seven, my family moved to the UK and this passion for space continued to the extent that I was going to my local library and consuming every book on astronomy and space that I could and uh, the library ran out of books and they ended up having to get more books from other libraries. Um, so this, this passion continued. Fast forward a number of years and this happened. No, I, 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 you might be thinking I was Neo and I was uh, offered the choice of a red or blue pill. What's true though is life is about choices. And I was at this corporate job in the financial industry at a, a little known firm called Goldman Sachs. Um, I've been working there for uh, a couple of years in, in the financial industry for uh, several years. And it was, I had this nagging feeling that, you know, this wasn't uh, where I belonged. This wasn't the industry that I felt passionate for. And at this time, I didn't really know that space, you could pursue a, a, a career in the space industry. And so I did a lot of research, looked, talked to people, and eventually came across the International Space University. And I'm fortunate to be where I am today, thanks to that, that education and the network of people that I, I, I was able to get to know. And it was actually at, in, at ISU where I ended up meeting my two future bosses. Carissa Christensen and Daniel Faber. From there, I uh, ended up doing a, a, a few years at uh, Inmarsat, working on a number of uh, programs uh, between the satellite uh, communications, kind of the technology side, so uh, procuring capacity, but also working with all of the business units and learned so much about the industry. But at Bryce, I had my first opportunity to help grow the U UK presence of a US originated company. And uh, with that, I got to learn so much about the industry. And you know, there's no better mentor than, than Carissa. So if you ever get the chance to work with her, I would highly recommend it. Um, I got to uh, work with international space agencies, helping them with their policy as well as uh, VC firms on conducting due diligence uh, for, for, for their investments, as well as private space companies who were looking to expand their um, uh, businesses and 
a whole host of other opportunities. Bryce is also well known for some of their uh, fantastic reports. I would highly recommend you check them out if you haven't uh, before. Um, and through that experience, I had a lot of challenging um, kind of experiences from how do you grow a, a whole new uh, business, a whole new practice for a, for a company in a completely different uh, ge geographic zone uh, to, to, to its origin. Um, and I got to build more, more relationships in, in the UK and, and Europe and build my understanding of the, of the sector even more. And then I had, uh, thereafter, more recently, I had the opportunity to uh, join OrbitFab uh, to lead their Euro European presence and uh, grow their uh, business. And once again, I had to learn some new lessons about how do you scale up a company. And that took a whole different kind of mindset. You know, consulting, you, you do advisory type of activities, so you... Uh, on a project-based uh, basis, and you get to work with very senior people and get to help them navigate challenging times. Um, but the idea of actually kind of leading a company and being the person at the helm of making some of those challenging de decisions means that you have to have a different frame of mind and how you tackle those challenges. So um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, be now at uh, uh, OrbitFab, leading their European office. And uh, OrbitFab, for those of you who don't know, is a company focused on building the in-orbit propellant supply chain, where we've been uh, working on a number of missions in the US and in the UK, um, and excited to see what the future has, has to offer. I've also had amazing opportunities meeting uh, the, the, the UK, the, the, His Royal Majesty the King. Um, that was quite a unique uh, experience, I must say. Um, but also get, getting to work with some fat, fantastic people, really, really smart people who are trying to do what's not really been done before. Uh, we've, we've not been able to refuel satellites at a scale that we want. And it's a major problem in the industry that we launch assets and then we throw them away. It'd be crazy if you drove your car once to the destination and then the fuel ran out and then you ditched it on the highway. That's basically what we do with satellites. So we need to change that. And um, well, most recently, I was uh, fortunate to be involved with the fundraising aspect of uh, OrbitFab where we um, completed the Series A. As you can see, uh, if I can go back, it's uh, loading a bit too quickly. Um, the, the blue line is the space SPACs. And we started raising funds kind of towards the bottom of that for our Series A. As you can imagine, it was quite a challenging environment to be doing this. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we were really at the bottom of the market. So it took us a bit longer, but we were fortunate to um, uh, close our Series A earlier this year uh, of, of about $28 million. So um, yeah, we're, we're excited to be building this future and uh, yep, uh, if, if there's any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Thank you. Manny, thank you so much for that presentation. We have uh, quite a few questions from the audience, and uh, I have a couple questions myself. So first question, you could be seen as an expert in helping US companies expand into the UK. What are some of the challenges that you faced in doing that, and what do you think are the exciting opportunities that exist for companies that want to expand into the United Kingdom? That's a great question. Obviously, that for companies that are US-based, there's so many different ge geographies they could go to. And the way I see it, the UK is a fantastic launch pad for going into Europe, going into the rest of the world, because you get to test a market and then you get to understand where you want to go from there. So in terms of some of the challenges, you know, language isn't a barrier, so it's an opportunity. Um, I would say there's a smaller, uh, in terms of the budgets, shall we say, compared to the US. Um, though in the UK those budgets are increasing for space and very, if you're looking at the in-orbit servicing manufacturing markets, very suited for that. 
And um, so I'm, I feel like I'm talking more about the opportunities and, than the challenges. But uh, one of the challenges that the industry more generally has commented on is, is um, skills. How do we bring the right talent to, to the table for uh, building this future? And that is certainly one of the challenges that is, is, is evident. Um, although as we're a relatively smaller company, we haven't had to come across those issues just yet. But I imagine as you scale up, those will become more and more evident. Yeah. Thanks. So you mentioned about meeting one of your best friends and your future bosses at ISU. How do you make the jump from a connection to your network to a concrete job opportunity? Very good question. Uh, I would say it's, it has a lot to do with being curious and asking questions. In fact, I believe it was uh, how, uh, Carissa was doing a, an a external talk at ISU, and uh, and I think we both raised our hands at that uh, at that uh, talk. And from there, we kind of well, I reached out to Carissa and just wanted to kind of understand more about the industry. And uh, from there, I was able to learn about what Bryce was doing and just kept in touch over the years and you know, making sure that you're not losing contact with the people that you meet at these conferences, I think is really, really uh, important. And similarly with uh, Daniel Faber, I kept in touch, uh, we try to keep up to date on what uh, he was up to with the different benches. I originally actually uh, met him when he was leading Deep Space Industries, which was focused on uh, asteroid mining. So kind of a way out there stuff. Um, my thesis was actually on uh, asteroid mining. So he was a very great kind of resource to understand what the opportunities were and feed that into my thesis. So I think it's all about being curious and asking questions and, 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 and keeping, staying in touch with, uh, with uh, people like that. Yeah. Two last questions, Matty. One regarding your finance background. How has that helped you navigate the space sector and in your current positions? And I'll ask the other question as a two-part. What's next after the Series A? Any plans for Orbit Fab? So how has my finance background helped me in my career? I would say it's helped me tremendously to have that uh, commercial awareness and business understanding of where the pitfalls might be, you know, working, having worked at an investment bank, I got to see from the other side of the table what they would consider and some of the challenges that are there, not just at a kind of micro level, but a macroeconomic level as well. So having that understanding and the, and the context within which the space industry sits is so um, powerful, I would say. Um, and then the second question was on series after what's that, what's, what's next, next? Series a? for so um, yes we, we you know as a startup we, we we're you know always interested if there are entities that are looking to invest uh, we you know we've done our series a we're, we're good for a while but if there's any folks that are interested strategic investors or such we're always uh, happy to listen and, and you know uh, give you a sense of what, what we're doing and how we can um, help build the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me thank you, Manny Shah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. So that brings us to the end of the panel today. I'd really like to thank everyone for your participation, for your questions. And I hope that the stories that you heard today help you personally as you navigate your own personal challenges. We had the opportunity to hear stories from all across the world, various issues, various problems, but there's always some solutions. And if you have the chance, make sure that you try to stop some of the speakers. I think they'd be willing to talk to you more. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for participating.